hopefully most of you were able to see our patient this morning, and I'm going to be presenting her a case of acanthamoeba keratitis. So this is a 36-year-old female who's a soft contact lens wearer, and she presented on July 27th with a pain of red eye in her right eye. Uh, she also was having some light sensitivity pains. She described pressure through the whole eye. She'd been seen two weeks prior at uh, instant care and was given a prescription for topical antibiotics. Uh, a week after that, she hadn't been getting better, and so she was given a prescription for Pred Forte four times a day at the instant care. Um, and then one day prior to her presentation, she was started on POA Cyclovir. Uh, she reported good contact lens hygiene. She was replacing her biweekly lenses every 10 days. She denied any swimming or showering in her lenses, and she was not using tap bar for cleaning. She also had not, didn't have a history of swimming in freshwater bodies. So th there are her medications. She didn't have other medical problems. Her only other medication was an oral contraceptive. She did have the history of contact lens use and no ocular surgery in the past. And she had a history of remote possible viral keratitis in the past. She had a family ocular history of a sister who'd been diagnosed with multifocal choroiditis. So this is her exam on presentation. She was 2200 pinpoint to 2040 uncorrected in her right eye with a mild myopic refraction. 2070. Left eye uncorrected was 2025. Her, the exam of her left eye was normal. And her right eye, she had diffuse injection. She had a central epithelial defect in the cornea with some scattered areas of haze and, and a large number of updated epithelial erosions and some mild peripheral elevation in the cornea with superficial neovascularization extending from the limbus. She didn't have a hypobion, and the rest of her anterior segment exam was normal. Yeah. She had a pressure that was slightly lower in the right eye, and 22 in the left eye, and normal dilated exam on both sides. So the initial differential was suspected infectious keratitis with possible atypical bacterial or fungal keratitis given the extended time course since her initial presentation at the NSA care. Um, there was also consideration for acanthamoeba, especially given her contact lens use. Uh, given her history of possible viral keratitis, there was a thought that this could be corneal scarring with the recurrence of viral keratitis or HSV keratitis. Um, so our, our initial changes to her therapy were to stop the steroids. Uh, we started her on a cycloplegic and continued her on an appropriate dose of acyclovir for HSV keratitis. And then we added, a, added back a topical antibiotic drop um, and performed a culture for virus, bacteria, and fungus and told her to refrain from contact lens use. So here's, here's her clinical course. A couple days after her presentation, her vision decreased to hand motion and she had an increase in the amount of pain she was having she was seen in clinic and started on fortified vancomycin and tobramycin every hour around the clock. Uh, she came back a couple days later uh, and had a 7.5 by 7 millimeter central epithelial defect that was round with peripheral haze. You can see uh, you can see the pictures on the bottom right showing her exam on that day uh, with kind of diffuse haze and you can see her epithelial defect pretty well in this picture. It's hard to see, but she had peripheral neovascularization coming in from the limbus. And we performed confocal microscopy because we were concerned about acanthamoeba. Here's, here are her pictures from the confocal microscopy. You can see there are some areas that were concerning for acanthamoeba cysts here. All, the, all those clinical pictures are from one day or a time? Those are, those are all from August 1st. Okay. I just wanted to show an example of a normal confocal microscopy. So the, the relevant pictures here are especially C and, and D. Those are the anterior and posterior stroma in a normal cornea compared to our patient on the bottom where you can see these possible cysts that are highlighted there. Uh, so she, she came back for a couple other visits over the next two weeks. 
Her epithelial defect on, on August 17th had improved significantly from 7.5 by 7 to 4.5 by 3.5. Her vision had improved from hand motion to count fingers. Uh, so then these are pictures on the 24th on the right side. And you can see the epithelial defect in this picture. If you look compared to over here, it appears to be improving. She has a little bit of clearing in the periphery of the cornea of the stromal infiltrate. She was, on the 24th, we decreased the, the PHNV and chlorhexidine that had been started uh, just over two weeks prior to every three hours, six times a day each. And we decreased her fortified antibiotics to once daily and told her when they run out that she can change to an oral fluoroquinolone or a topical fluoroquinolone. At this point, all of her final cultures, including the viral and acanthamoeb cultures, had been negative. So um, this morning, she, her epithelial defect had continued to decrease. It was about three and a half by three and a half this morning. And she has pretty significant clearing of the stromal infiltrate. And the periphery looks fairly clear now. Her vision still count fingers. Um, so this is a summary of our case. We have her current therapy on the bottom here, but she's improved pretty significantly so far. So I just wanted to go over some basics about risk factors and features and medical and surgical management for acanthamoeba the keratitis. So then the number one risk factor is contact lens use, and other risk factors are related to contact lens use, multi-purpose cleaning solution, which is not effective against acanthamoeba cysts. Uh, swimming and showering and contact lenses, as well as fresh water swimming. Uh, so clinical features are pain that's disproportionate to the clinical exam. There's a large percentage of patients uh, that have been demonstrated to have co-infection with HSV or other bacteria. Um, there, some of the typical features on exam are an epithelial epitheliopathy or punctate keratopathy, which our patient had on her initial presentation. Uh, there, you can see pseudodendrites and especially paraneural infiltrates. Here's a good picture of the paraneural infiltrates and the amoeba feeds on the corneal nerves, which results in the, the disproportionate pain. Uh, then there's the classic ring infiltrate which you can see in this bottom picture, but that's only present in about 50% of patients with acanthamoeba keratitis infections. And some poor, poor prognostic factors that you can find are also cataract formation if the infection extends more <coughs> posteriorly. So for diagnosis of acanthamoeba keratitis, culture on uh, non-nutrient inactivated E. coli auger. It's important to also culture the contact lenses in case if those are available. And there are a variety of stains, calcifloor white, uh, acridine orange, and gram stains that can be used that are helpful in diagnosis. Confocal microscopy has been shown with experienced graders to have a high specificity and sensitivity, uh, around 90% for both, for both, but there is the risk of a lot of false positives and negatives with confocal microscopy, uh, especially with with inexperienced con confocal microscopists. Um, there, some newer techniques are DNA PCR, but there are there's a lot of expense and technical issues with this, and for a better yield, it requires some tissue. So, recommended medical treatment is. Uh, there are basically two classes of medications, and these work synergistically. It's recommended, it, usually people use a combination of agents because of the risk of resistance of the acanthamoeba organism. Uh, the first class is the biguanides, which is PHMB low, in low concentration, and chlorhexidine, which is less toxic to the corneal epithelium uh, in low concentration. Those. Those work by disrupting the cytoplasmic membrane and damaging cell components. Then the second class is diamidine, which can work synergistically with the biguanides, and that includes bro broline and hex hexamidine. Uh, and those are also effective against both the trophozoites and the cysts. So the recommended regimen is every hour 
around the clock for the first 48 hours and then decreasing to every hour for a period of days to weeks depending on the clinical response. And then therapy may need to be continued for up to six months because of uh, the cysts penetrating into the deep stroma and, and how resistant they are. And some people recommend even continuing for up to a year. So surgical treatment, um, the, this has changed a lot and therapeutic PK is no longer recommended and it should only be used in cases where there's perforation that's unresponsive to repeat gluing or large perforations that there's no other option. And some, some studies have shown that multilayer AMT can be used prior to, to uh, penetrating keratoplasty. Uh, and there are, there are a few case studies now that people are showing use of corneal cross-linking. Um, there is conflicting evidence in the in vitro studies showing that riboflavin A and UV light may be amebicidal, but there are other in vitro studies showing that it may not be. There are mostly international case studies, specifically one in Mexico and one in Spain that were done where they treated uh, active acanthamoeba ulcers with corneal cross-linking. Uh, and they, they did show in those studies that after, after the resolution of the infection, they did a penetrating keratoplasty and on pathology there was absence of amoeba, side, of amoeba cysts. So this may be something in the future that could be a possibility for a treatment of acanthamoeba keratitis. But there aren't any good controlled studies of this yet. Okay, happy to answer any questions. The slide did not indicate whether or not she might have been wearing her contact lenses 24 hours a day for a day or a couple of days or all 10 days before she put in a new lens. It would be interesting to know if that would have to be a factor. Yeah, she, she said that she was not. She, she said that she was taking contact lenses out every day. She was replacing them every 10 days. And she, didn't, she didn't admit to any risk factors with her contact lens use of it just for the Sometimes it's denial. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Um, were you able to culture the case or the solution to find out if those were the factors? Uh, no. So that, that's actually becoming a little bit more difficult to do. Our lab is like rejecting our ability to culture things like that because they're we had a case earlier this year where it's a long discussion with them about it. They don't want us sending solutions <coughs> to them from the contact lenses because they feel like it drives the clinical course potentially in the wrong way because you're not for sure that it's the same bug as what's growing on the eye. So I, was, I fought that battle with them trying to get them to allow us to do that, but it sounds like they're not letting us culture contact lenses or cases at this point. So I think, I mean, this is a, I just want to talk about the culture thing, because I think it's, uh, this is a perfect example of the diagnostic. I mean, this is actually what we see all the time here. And it almost, it usually comes down to herpes simplex versus acanthamoeba after treatment of a bacterial infection, you know, presumed bacterial infection with negative cultures. And so, you know, Obviously, when you're on call, you know, try to get infectious keratitis patients to come here. Don't give advice over the phone. I mean, the cultures are just hugely, hugely helpful. And early treatment and diagnosis is critical in, in Kevin And when you're on call, I would say, in a person like this, put a lid speculum in, take the patient to the minor room, lay them flat, numb the heck out of them, and take a blade and debris the epithelium and wad that all up. And if you're suspicious of acanthamoeba, put that in Page's saline. You can use a Acron swab. We usually use the viral swab. You just take an extra one of those and put it in the Page's saline and send that. And I would say that the yield in an early case is pretty high if you're aggressively culture. And the, you know, the diagnosis, if you make the diagnosis, you can usually reverse this and if you don't then it's this polytherapy for a long time because you don't really know what's going on and the confocal sounds great but in practice it's pretty tough I mean this was a fairly early case and I think that you know it's fortunate when you can see that but it's often very difficult and 
then, you know, with regard to the contact lens uh, case and or solution, I would just say, you know, send a separate culture, just e-swab it because that's what the lab wants now. And you can even label it cornea 2 or whatever and just send it. <laughs> yep. and they won't know the difference, but we'll know what it is. But I think it is really useful. We've definitely cultured it from contact lens cases before. And that's actually made the diagnosis for us and made it uh, helpful. And then the other thing to think about, you mentioned co-infection, but I had a patient who was treated for months, you know, weeks to months, and aggressively scraped her. She grew fungus, acanthamoeba, and a gram-negative bacteria. And I don't think any of them were contaminants. And so you really have to think about, uh, and that patient actually did well. Treated with polypharmacy and so think about co-infection. The worst thing about sitting in the back is you don't get to make the comments until everybody else said what you were going to say. But, but yeah, what Mark says. <laughs> but um, sometimes it's difficult to get uh, acanthamoeba to grow if you're doing a superficial scraping, and, and it can be tough to get it to grow if you're still really concerned, I know it's hard to go in and do a little biopsy of the cornea, but sometimes we can actually see the cysts on a, on a biopsy. We've got some special stains that can actually make the diagnosis. The, the second comment I want to make is we really need to work with our colleagues at the Instacares and Doc in the Boxes. Um, those guys use steroids way really too much. They don't know what they're treating. And you always see everybody with a red eye gets Tobradax. You know, if it's a virus, if and they can't the amoeba, they should not be on steroids. And I think we need to educate our colleagues that steroid use is dangerous. And that, that you know, someone who really is not comfortable looking at things and diagnosing things at a sweat lamp should not be using topical steroids. So, is someone going to answer that? Or just I just had a question. Um, isn't um, chlorhexidine um, the active ingredient of the Yes. Isn't that felt to be like highly yes. toxic? <laughs> at, at low, at really low concentrations though, which are compounded for use in acanthamoeba infections, it's it's yeah. it's the least toxic of the of the type of medications <laughs> that are used for epithelial cells. I can't remember what the cons the percentage is in like <coughs> it's like two percent or something. It's you know orders of magnitude higher. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, we have the reason Dr. Warner asks is that hibiclins or you know chlorhexidine-based cleaners are sometimes an alternative to iodine for uh, prep of skin. And we had a uh, case not too long ago where basically the patient had their epithelium cooked because there was hibiclins in the eye. It wasn't really rinsed very well, so it didn't really cause long-term damage, but it certainly can be toxic in higher concentrations. As I recall, the first big outbreak of acanthamoeba was kind of brought to popular knowledge because of the homemade saline solution that was kind, of, kind of precipitated this. Has that kind of gone away now? Yeah, I don't. Two percent. I mean, I don't. I don't know any specific studies indicating, but I don't think many people are using that anymore. That's definitely cleaning with water or just regular saline is a culprit for acanthamoeba infections. That's not I was just wondering uh, what the utility of like using something like proline. I don't think it's approved in the U.S. and I can contaminate it as far as you know in the early course. I mean, you you throw the uh, the armory at acanthamoeba. So we often, most of our patients, we try to have them get online and buy these drugs internationally, and usually you can. You now we uh, we have a really awful acanthamoeba patient where. We're like a year into treatment now, and he hasn't lost his eyes, so we consider that a success. But uh, we had, you know, he they found a website and got the hexamidine drops from France for five bucks or so, five euros. And so, so you can't. I mean, there is more availability, and, and you know, certainly we try to bring medicines back when we travel and, and just give them to patients. You can't tell them. I think there's a company in the UK that makes brogan for acanthamoeba yeah. infections. Yeah, you can get an internet for brogan. 